Okay. Hello, Dr. Joe. Welcome back. <laughs> it's happy to be, I'm very happy to be with you, Kasia. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And it's been a while. I think last time we spoke in this space, it was last year, March, and we were sort of in a still mid of pandemia happening. And we thought we can take a break, at least in this part of the world, in Europe. Um, and we don't have a break. Uh, it looks like we're experiencing <laughs> another crisis. So I was just thinking that maybe we could start uh, with you helping our students, our community um, to understand how to use your work to, mm. you know, to make sense of that shift that is happening. Um, I was recently in Poland, I witnessed a few things. There's 3 million people um, constantly, well, being, living, trying also make sense in this new space. So I thought that might be a good start. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. And, and I'm happy to talk about it on two levels. Um, the first level is just, um, we have just done two progressive workshops in the last two weekends, one in Panama, in Panama City, and one in the United States in Denver, Colorado. And these are large groups of people really uh, coming together from anywhere between 45 to 60 different countries around the world. And um, one of the things that I found so important during the pandemic or any global crisis, uh, and it was a great lesson for me because we had two people uh, stand on the stage, one in each event uh, that were diagnosed with very serious health conditions. One was a physician from uh, the United States. Uh, the other was just a, a, a middle-aged woman, a younger woman actually, who was diagnosed with, with cancer, both of them with cancer diagnoses. Uh, uh, the first woman from, from Argentina had five different health conditions uh, and was scheduled for a liver transplant. The other doctor had uh, a, a serious progressive, very, very rare cancer that's in very, very, very small percentage of the population. And she's a doctor, you know, so uh the lesson is that these people never came to a progressive workshop uh, they never came to a week-long event uh, they read the books and they got very serious about not healing this mm -hmm. is so important but what do i need to change about myself mm -hmm. and if i truly change myself then healing should be the side effect mm -hmm of my own personal change. Now that goes for anything, whether it's your healing, whether you want abundance in your life, whether you want a new relationship, whether you want a mystical experience, a better job, it's the same process because if our personality creates our personal reality and we have to change our personality to change our personal reality, then nothing changes in our life until we change. And so these people really uh, were great examples for the community to show that you actually can do it on your own. I mean, it really is uh, something if you got serious about changing the way you think, mm -hmm. uh, changing the way you act and changing the way you feel. And meditation is about becoming so familiar with that personality that's connected to the present or past personal reality that you don't go unconscious because the 95 percent of who we are in our middle ages middle age is really just hardwired thoughts because we keep thinking them over again uh, ha habits that we've that we've done so many times that the body now does it better than the conscious mind and then just looking at the emotions that we feel every day and deciding if these emotions are loving to us and so many people by denaturing or breaking down that old personality started to create a new personality thinking about how they do want to think and and reviewing that in their mind and and rehearsing uh before they reach for their cell phone in the morning uh who they're going to be when they open their, their eyes and how they're going to live their life that day that, that one day whether they're in zoom calls whether they're with their children whether they're with uh, people that they work with, to really think about a better way to act. And the research shows that when we rehearse it in our minds, uh, the brain looks like we've already done it. So you keep doing that over and over again, it becomes more automatic. So, and then teaching our body emotionally what our future will feel like before it happens, I think is so important um, and become so familiar mm -hmm. with those thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that, that we become them. Mm -hmm. 
So, so the evidence is out there and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to witness when people really take the time out of their lives to really practice the work with the intention of understanding that I have to change in order for something in my life to change. I love to see those examples of truth because it gives people permission uh, in so many ways to practice it on their own. And it's not a difficult thing to do. It just takes a little bit of time and attention and a little bit of energy. So, so the first thing is, is do the work and, and understand what you're doing when you do it and understand why you're doing it so that the how becomes more easy and becomes more instrumental and we can assign meaning uh, to the act and that's so important so number one um if we haven't gotten to poland yet and we're going to get there beginning of next year for sure that's on the that's on the calendar in the meantime practice 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 and then when we get there it'll just be like refining your skill it'll help people to get a little bit uh, uh, better at it so that's point number one. In, in, in spite of what's going on in the world, there are people that I've met during the pandemic as an example, of, you know, whether it's a pandemic or a war, that are flourishing in so many ways. They're starting new businesses, they're becoming abundant, they're starting new lives, they're meeting new people, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're changing, you know. So in spite of what's going on in the environment, somehow they're, they're not victims to those circumstances. So that's point number one. Point number two is that you may not be able to control everything that's going on in the world. Let's face it, we're, we're, we're faced with so many challenges globally uh, and, and you may not be able to control any of those outcomes. But what we've discovered is that people could actually control their inner world of thoughts and feelings independent of what's going on in the outer world. And you may not be able to solve the crises of the world, whether it's war or world hunger, but but you can contribute in some way by by paying attention to your responses to the challenges and conditions in your life. And I realized just this year that if I don't change my responses to the certain conditions in the world or in my life, then I'm never going to change. Mm -hmm. And when you learn how to change your responses, you don't default back to that old personality again. So, so the formula that we use to help people to self-regulate their inner state has to do with being able to maintain a certain amount of heart coherence. And we have people that can do that really well, eyes open, eyes closed, they just mastered that skill. And they've worked really hard on creating more order and more coherence in their brain. So that that translates really into being relaxed in our heart mm. and awake in our brain instead of stressed out and tense and in survival and in a program and trying to force and control everything in our life. It goes completely counterintuitive to the way the world functions, especially when there's crisis, because when there's crisis, there's emergency. When there's emergency, uh, uh, people are relying on somebody or something to take care of them to remove the crisis. It's a very primitive, primitive uh, mechanism. So then when we learn how to be calm when everybody else is angry and agitated, when we learn how to show courage when everybody else is showing fear, uh, when we learn how to be compassionate when everybody else is in conflict. Uh, these are the things that have to be demonstrated uh, in so many ways for the world to see that there is actually a better way of being. And, and, and you know, the simple principle is just, let me show up in the world today how I want the world to be. If you actually practice not telling people you need to forgive your mother or to forgive your ex or you need to you know um, learn how to uh, be more emotionally intelligent talking about that to people in crisis doesn't resolve their state but if you show them what it looks like to be great to show them what love does to show them that when everybody else is unhappy 
you're actually grounded and present. I think it gives people permission to do the same. So the side effect of that in our community, and it's now thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, is they do the work really not because they want to do the right thing or please God or not feel guilty or try to change their lives. They do it because they understand when they truly do make a change in their energy that their life changes. And that's the fun part of the experiment. So, <clears throat> excuse me, while the world is falling apart or going through any kind of transition, uh, that's when it matters the most. Because when it's the hardest and it's the most difficult, it matters the most because the fundamental question is, who is going to lead in that state? And the answer is, not one person, not one government, everybody should be leading. And that's an emergent consciousness. And so we have to show up for the, for the world in a way that, that demonstrates what change looks like and demonstrates what greatness looks like. And when people actually see that, they turn on neurons in their brain called mirror neurons, which says, hey, if, if Kasha is doing it, she looks pretty happy. She looks she's doing well. I'm gonna, well I want to do that. I want to do that instead of being unhappy and suffering. So, so I think it's, I think it's twofold. And, and while the crisis in the world is going on, sure, it's, it's horrible and it's, it's difficult for a lot of people, but wars have been going on for thousands of years over the most insignificant and meaningless things. And, and people lose their lives as a result of it. And, and, and they lose their homes and they lose their stability. And, and, and we have to, in some way, show the world that there is hope we have to show them uh what it looks like uh, uh to re to really be greater than our environment mm. and that's beautiful thank you it was showing up for me you know like you always says like what would love do what compassion would do what courage would do and and, and tune tune to that so thank you and it doesn't it doesn't have to be anything for the world mm -hmm. it could be seeing an elder uh, a sweet person who's having difficulty getting in her car mm -hmm. or reaching for something in the supermarket or has dropped something mm -hmm. or a best friend that you know is really down and really hurting that you decide to take the afternoon off and take them out to lunch and encourage them that they can they can do it. It's, this is so many crises divide communities and divide cultures and divide people. This is completely counter to that. This is saying, let's commune, let's connect. And it just turns out that when we live in those survival emotions like fear and anger and aggression and resentment and envy and, and pain and suffering and guilt, they divide community. That's what they exactly break community. They, they, they divide community because in survival, you got to take care of yourself, right? But when we feel elevated emotions, it, it actually activates pro-social networks in the brain and suppresses the protective and aggressive networks in the brain. So the pro-social networks cause us to do what? Feel really appreciative of what we have in the present moment. And it causes us to move closer together as community. Mm -hmm. So the only way a community is going to thrive is in love, is in gratitude, is in those states counter to whatever's going on in the world. And I think that's, that's difficult because it goes, you have to lay down so many instincts about mm -hmm. what we do in survival to allow something greater to occur and and if there's ever a time in history where it matters i would say now is the time yeah and that's the our way of making a dent in the universe that's how i like to see it a small dent in the universe so. i agree thank you for that okay well then other question that is showing up um in the community is if you could explain the difference between being a linear being living a linear life versus dimensional being living a multidimensional life. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Do we have enough time for that question? Oh my God. Uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, let's, let's reason it. Let's just see if we can reason it just from a Newtonian um, uh, material a predictable perspective. And let's see if we can name it from a quantum perspective, just mm -hmm. to give people an understanding. So um, we live in this, the illusion 
of this three-dimensional reality. And <clears throat> it's our senses that plug us into this, this hologram, this simulation, where you are an outblooming mm -hmm. of consciousness. All matter is a blooming of consciousness from source, right? So you're connected no different than a, a rose that's planted in the earth. The rose is the expression of life, but you know the roots are, are in something that's that, where it originates from. All the roots mm -hmm. and the soil representing source, okay? So, so everybody has their own expression of matter. And it's our senses that, that if we see things, we hear things, we smell things, we taste things, uh, we feel things with our body. And when, when we open our eyes in, in, in our day, um, we become aware that we're an identity, we're, we're local, we're in three-dimensional reality in uh, this, this space, I'm occupying space in a particular time. So, so my identity is really created by identifying with everything that's known in my three-dimensional world. That's all the people I know. That's the body that I wear. It's my, you know, it's, it's my, uh, it's the places that I've lived. It's the things that I own, the objects that I interact with, my cell phone, my computer, uh, what my past uh, has shown me who I am. And I remember that as best as I can. And then what my goals or my visions or what my future looks like. And, and so then we live in this realm where there's this called space time and there's an infinite amount of space in this universe or multiverse. Your space is eternal. And, and the way we function in separation is that I'm, I'm aware as an individual awareness of individual consciousness that I'm sitting right here. Mm -hmm. But then if I have a vision or a desire to experience something else, like I want to go out the front door, well, then I'm aware that there's another point of consciousness that I want to experience, and that is to go through the door. Mm -hmm. So the only way in three-dimensional reality for me to go from one point of awareness to another point of awareness is actually to move my body through space. When I move my body through space, it takes me time. So everything in three-dimensional reality takes time and energy. You know, you have a goal also to have a, a beautiful life or a beautiful future or own a home or whatever that is your brain becomes aware that you're here, I'm in the present moment, and I don't have that beautiful home and that beautiful life. And so I'm experiencing separation again from one point of awareness, the thought of what I want, but the experience of what I want, our brain estimates like, oh, you're gonna have to save a lot of money, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to work overtime, you're gonna have to work a second job, you're gonna have to dip into your savings, um, you know, you're going to have to sacrifice and not do certain things and save up as much as you can to get that new house. And then you got to make payments on that house, which means you got to work and that takes a lot of time and energy. And then you got to drive to work and that takes energy. You got to put gas in your car, but you got to pay for the gas and you got to eat. And then because you don't have enough energy and food keeps you going, throwing a little stress and now you're not sleeping as much and, and you're out of balance and you're not healthy and you have pain. And this is kind of the game. And, and so when the experience of you finally owning that house and paying it off in 20 years or 30 years, the experience finally happens. The end product of the experience in three-dimensional reality is the, the emotion. Mm -hmm. And the emotion is the payoff. It's the relief from separation, right? And so if we look at and examine what a person they're actually spending 30 years of their life living in separation or lack or emptiness, waiting for the event to finally occur so that they could feel some relief from the separation of not having it. Okay, nothing wrong with that. The realm of three-dimensional reality is the plane of demonstration. You gotta do stuff mm -hmm. in this three-dimensional reality because we're in separation. Now throw in the hormones of stress and stress is living in survival and stress heightens the senses and it causes us to become more immersed in the virtual reality experience of three-dimensional reality. And now all of our attention is more on objects and things and places and people. And the arousal causes us to feel more like we're our bodies. And we're always trying to predict the future based on the past. And in survival, you're, pit, you're, you're, you're imagining the worst thing that could happen, not the best thing that could happen. You're preparing for the worst because if anything that happens that's less than the worst thing that could happen, you're prepared for it. There's better chances of survival. People live this way. Okay. 
So let's tease it out just a little bit further. If you wake up in the morning and you start thinking about your problems, and for the most part, your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced in this three-dimensional reality. It's a storehouse, a repository of knowledge and information that becomes the autobiographical self. Okay. If I wake up in the morning and I think about my problems, the first thing I do is think about how bad the world is or how bad my life is or how much money I don't have or how much how sick I am and why, what do I need to do? And your brain, the moment you start remembering your problems, memories are just reflections of the past, right? They're, they're echoes of what we've experienced in the past. So the moment we think about our problems, we're not actually thinking anything new in the future. We're actually thinking the same in the past. So we're thinking in the past. And if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your life, if you're thinking in the past, then you're thinking the same, your life is going to stay the same. Every one of those problems, though, has an emotion associated. The moment we feel unhappy, now our body's in the past. Now this becomes the problem because it's that thought and that feeling. It's the redundancy of that image or that memory and that emotion, that stimulus and response that starts the conditioning process for that emotion to be stored in the body and the body becomes the mind of that emotion. And the moment it's a subconscious state, the body's believing it's living in the same past experience all the time. It's so objective, it doesn't know the difference. Okay, so then how you think and how you feel is your state of being. Most people, when they wake up in the morning, they reaffirm their identity or their state of being based on the memories and emotions of the past. And if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny again, and those familiar emotions kind of anchor you into the same feeling of who you think you are, which may be unhappy or guilty or whatever. If you can't think greater than how you feel and feelings and emotions are a record of the past then you're thinking in the past, well, what does that mean? Well, then your life should stay the same because 90% of people's thoughts are the same. And, 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 and then they get up in the morning, they run through the same routine. And a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. Mm -hmm. Keep doing it over and over again. Your body can do it better than your conscious mind. That's what mm -hmm. a habit is. So for most people, then their body's on autopilot and it's programmed to do exactly what it's been doing for the last 10, 20 years. And it's dragging the person into the same predictable future based on what they did in the past. And now they lose their free will to choose anything new or unknown to a set of programs. Okay, so if they're thinking the same way based on the memories of the past and feeling the same way, and they're in a program of going through the same thing on autopilot every single day, well, the familiar past, they can, they can identify as the known. The predictable future becomes the known, and it's very linear. Mm -hmm. There's only one place where the unknown exists, and that's the present moment, right? So that's the, that unknown is the perfect place to create from. But if you're in survival and you're in stress, thousands of years of programming says the unknown is a scary place. Run. I mean, if there's something rustling in the bushes and it's at night and you can't identify it, uh, and you're not going to move towards it. You're going to move away from it. And so the unknown in survival has become a scary place instead of an, an adventure. Okay, so when we're creating, then things aren't going our way and we are an experience of matter. I matter living in a material world. And if I matter trying to change matter, then if it didn't work in really well, then I'm going to force it. I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to control it. I'm going to manipulate circumstances. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to lie. I'm, I'm, I'm going to compete. I'm going to do whatever I can to take care of that separation that I'm feeling. And I'm in urgency trying to get, get it done faster. So the illusion is waiting for it to happen out here, something to change out here so that I could feel better in here. But the program really is more of a victimization program, which means when things are going really bad out in my life, I'm feeling really bad and I'm thinking really unhealthy thoughts. Well, if the environment now is controlling the way I'm feeling and thinking, 
and I'm a victim to my environment. And that's not a conscious process. That's an unconscious process in linear time because people become relying on something outside of them to take away that those feelings and those thoughts. And, and it could be a drug, it could be a computer game, it could be, uh, you know, scrolling through Instagram, whatever people do to distract them from that feeling, they're very reliant on the outer world to do that. Okay. So then how you think and how you feel is creates an energetic field it really produces an energetic field. And so as long as you're thinking the same way and feeling the same way and doing the same things, uh, you're living in a very linear expression of time mm -hmm. in a past, present and future. And it's, and the way the brain works as an anticipation machine mm -hmm. is it likes to anticipate the next moment and fill it in with the known. So the person has experienced time in, in a very linear sense and, and they can tell you what they're going to do that day or who they're going to see or the meetings they have and where they go. Nothing's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But when we're really hooked into that habit of trying to anticipate the known, there's actually no room for the miracles or the unknown in our life. Okay. So if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and the majority of people's attention is anchored in the three-dimensional world on um, their body on all the elements in their environment and the preoccupation with time, then they have to play by the rules and everything is going to take an enormous amount of time for things to get done in our lives. We discovered that when a person really disinvests all their attention and energy off their body and their habits, their emotions, their drives and the pain, and they can get beyond their body. If they can take their attention off all of the elements in that make up their environment that they identify with the people in their life, where they live, where they work, where they sleep, uh, where they need to be. Um, if they can get beyond the addiction of their cell phone and, and technology and, and all the objects in their life that, that are known to them. And they're not thinking any longer about the predictable future and the familiar past as they disinvest all of their attention and energy out of this material three-dimensional world that's based on knowns, something really magical happens in the heart and the brain by no longer thinking about any of those elements they're no longer activating those circuits in the brain. The brain waves begin to change very naturally and the person is no longer so preoccupied with their body, with their environment and time they kind of slip into this present moment and we call that getting beyond themselves. Now, reality, according to quantum physics, is both particle and wave. It's both matter and energy. So if we take all of our attention off the material world, we're taking all of our attention off of everything that's matter, everything that's the particle in quantum physics. And there's a lot of energy uh, that makes up this universe. In fact, it's mathematically proven that we perceive less than 1% of reality. And the other 99% of reality is there. We're just unaware of it. Okay. So the quantum field exists. It's frequency, it's energy. There's, you can't experience the quantum field with your senses. You experience three dimensional reality with your senses. Okay. So the, is the quantum field real? Yeah, it absolutely is. It's scientifically proven, but if you're unaware of it and you've never experienced it and never interacted with it, then it doesn't exist for you, just like anything else. And so then teaching people how to take all their attention off the material world and put it on the immaterial world, take their attention off matter and put it on energy to go from narrowing their focus on objects and things to broadening their focus on nothing, on space, on, on this emptiness. The quantum field is that invisible field of energy that exists beyond our senses so then there's nothing there there we took away everything physical and material in the universe you would be left with a big vacuum and emptiness a void whatever you want to call that nothing and so many traditions and so many religions and so many cultures in history talk about this nothing as the source where everything material comes from it, right down to religious texts okay so if the person keeps putting their attention on energy and frequency, and they get to that point where they're pure consciousness and not identifying with anything known or material. That's the door to the quantum field, right? Now, 
if they get to that point and they begin to open their awareness to frequency and their brain and their heart are coherent, something really beautiful happens. They start interacting or entraining their nervous system to greater levels of order. The unified field whose signature is wholeness, signature is love, its signature is oneness connection, starts actually entraining the brain and the nervous system to get back into balance. And different compartments of the brain start to unify and the person starts to connect to energy and frequency. Now, when they do that, every time they feel it, every time they notice it, every time they experience it, every time they relax into it, every time they become aware of it, every time they feel more of it and less of them, every experience that they have with that energy, they're bringing it into their consciousness into their life by becoming aware of it every one of those experiences actually starts to make new connections in the brain they're wiring their brain for connection mm -hmm. okay so what's the value here well in the quantum it's the exact inverse of the way it is in linear newtonian three-dimensional reality there's a past present and future in linear reality in the quantum it's opposite. Instead of having an infinite amount of space and experiencing time as we move through space, in the quantum, it's the inverse. There's an infinite amount of time. Time is eternal. There's one big long now. So to make it simple, there's nothing local in space and time in quantum. It's all wave function. It's all possibility. And because you have an infinite amount of time, you have a lot of time. If you had all the time in the world to get things done, how many things could you do? Infinite a number of things. Well, this realm of thought, of frequency, every thought has a frequency, of energy, of vibration, of consciousness, whatever you want to call that, is connected. There's no separation there. So in the realm of the quantum, if you have an infinite amount of time, then there is no past, present, and future. The past, the present, and future are all happening at the same moment mm -hmm. in the quantum, which means then if all possibilities exist and you're a consciousness in this particular realm, you all only you don't have to create anything. You just have to become aware of whatever it is you want to experience it. And, and that non-local thought that hasn't materialized in three-dimensional mm -hmm. reality, you have to bring to life with your awareness. And every thought in this realm has a frequency. So then if you could feel the frequency of your new life, your health, before the event actually takes place, and you teach people how to create from the field instead of from matter, you could actually shorten the interval, mm -hmm. the time between the thought of what you want and the experience of having it. Now, why is that essential? Because when you get a coherent brain and a coherent heart and you're creating from the field instead of from matter, and Einstein said, it's the field that is the sole governing agent of the particle. The field controls the particle. He didn't say the particle controls the particle. He said the field controls the particle. Change the information in the field, you change the expression of the particle in three-dimensional reality. In other words, it's not matter that's emitting energy in the field. It's the field that's actually slowing down and creating matter. So if we can really learn how to dissociate mm -hmm. from this three-dimensional world, understand the pathway on how to get to this quantum place, have a really good coherent brain and a really good coherent heart, wow, now you have a Wi-Fi signal. Now you have the heart's putting out a magnetic field. The brain is putting out an electrical field and you've got a Wi-Fi signal. Now you can connect and create from the field instead of from matter. So it turns out that if you go really, really deep into this realm called time space, you could actually time travel. Let's see how I can say this. You could ex travel through time and experience so many aspects of you as the unknown Kasha mm -hmm. that isn't the person that's living in three-dimensional reality, that has a future self, that has a past self, that has so many experiences that causes us to realize, oh my God, if I, I don't have to go through space to, uh, to experience something, I actually just have to change my thought. And if I change my thought, I'm changing my frequency and I can experience so many different things. Now, here's the cool part. 
if we practice this and there's a vibrational match between my energy and some potential that I want in a quantum field as an experience and I'm creating from that field, now we break down the rules of Newtonian physics. I don't have to do anything mm -hmm. to get it. If I'm connected to that field that governs everything material, why would I go anywhere? I'm connected to source. So the closer I move towards that singularity, that zero point field to oneness, to wholeness, to pure love, whatever you want to call that unifying intelligence that's keeping all of this three dimensional reality in order, it lives within every single human being and all around them. The closer I get to it, the shorter amount of time I should have some experience in my life. So it becomes an experiment. If I can change my energy, instead of going and getting things, I should have opportunities, synchronicities, coincidences, mm -hmm. starting to show up in my life without having to go and do something. Now, I don't know about you, but I've done the other one really well. It's taken me a lot of time. You get educated, you learn, you make the right choices, you plan for your, your, your life, you do all of that and you, you keep doing that, you get good at it, you get skilled at it. But there's gotta be another way. Mm -hmm. And so teaching people how to create from the field instead of from matter causes the experience to come to them. Now throw in the mystical experience, uh, when you throw in the mystical experience, then there are infinite, mm -hmm. infinite, uh, uh, possibilities for us to experience it. No different than standing in a, a dressing room uh, or in a bathroom where there's two mirrors and you're looking down those mirrors and you see an infinite number of views. That's how reality is. And if, if you do the work properly, when you come out of your meditation, you're not in that same little room with those mirrors. You're actually in another one that looks just like that one. And every single thing thing in the multiplicity of the multiverse is exactly the same in three-dimensional reality except there's something different mm -hmm. there's a coincidence there's a synchrony ah so now i moved into another dimension it's seamless keep doing that and now your three-dimensional reality actually appears as a different reality than the reality that you were living that other reality where you haven't changed mm -hmm. is still there because there's an infinite number of ones but your awareness is now experiencing something else and we see people when they interact with this energy, they actually get an upgrade in their body. Mm -hmm. Change in their health or a change in their mind. They're not in the same environment. They're in a different life. Something changes in their life. There's something cool that's happening. And they're not in that same linear time, little timeline headed for a genetic outcome. Mm -hmm. They're all of a sudden in a new future. Uh, they're in a whole new future. And so, so, that's a lot of information, but the bottom line is, is you got to let go of this three-dimensional world and your attention on it, dissociate, put more your attention on energy and frequency and create from there as an experiment to see that if you could produce outcomes in your life that come to you, that's when it gets fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's interesting. I was just looking at the question and in this, this big question, you covered actually two other questions, but I just want to like go a little bit. And I know you said it, but I love how you say it in a different way. So people actually get it. So when we talk about the uh, um, quantum unified field, how do we know we are there? I know. I know, like people asking, how do I know I actually got it? Like I, I am there. And the other one is like, how specifically, what is like the formula to tune to that new potential? If you were just like one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's like a fish being in water asking for a drink. I mean, I know. <laughs> there is, we are, I mean, we're just unaware of that field. Okay. So, um, it turns out that when people learn how to slow their brain waves down um, and move out of that aroused state of high beta that people spend the majority of their time in because that's they got to be awake and aware of everything in their life and they got to move really fast and there's danger and there's appointments and there's cell phones and there's you know emails and everything. that is a very very aroused state in the brain can't create anything from there because the neocortex is telling you that's where reality is out there. 
But if you take away all your senses, if you're not seeing and you're not hearing and you're not smelling and you're not tasting, you're not feeling, take away all your senses, you have no experience of the three-dimensional reality, but you're still aware. You're still aware that you're aware, right? So, so when people ha uh, practice slowing their brain waves down and move into alpha, their inner world tends to be a little bit more real than their outer world. If they could get to the point, Kasha, where they could actually work with their body to the point where it's so relaxed mm -hmm. and trust them so much that they could relax fully into their heart and be in the present moment by relaxing into their heart. We've seen the data on this. Their brain moves into this theta brainwave state. And now theta is a hypnotic state. Mm -hmm. It's one where very suggestible to information. Information, like a, a hypnotist, can program people to do things because the person has no analytical mind. Well, the analytical mind separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind. So when we suppress our analytical facilities, we open the door between worlds, right? Okay. But here's the weird part if you're in a meditation and your eyes are closed and music's playing and you're not eating and you're not smelling, you're not tasting, you're not moving around and feeling. There's only one other place that we can get information from. And that's frequency because all frequency carries information. Okay. And it makes total sense then. Then when there's coherence in the brain and the brain is in training to frequency, the brain could actually transduce the information on that frequency into very profound experiences in the brain. So, so the practice changing your brain waves, slowing, slowing them down, and working with your body every time it gets agitated, every time it gets impatient, every time it gets tired and fatigued and discouraged, that's, that's all a program. Mm -hmm. You got to, you got to execute a will that's greater than that program. And you got to recondition the body to a new mind. And it's something that takes practice. And it's something that you have to keep doing because the quantum is the unpredictable. It's the unknown. And we, we can't predict when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. So the act of doing this over and over again, the person can get to that point where they're relaxed in their heart and awake in their brain. There is a dramatic, dramatic interaction that takes place between those two organs that causes the person to actually begin to feel connected. Mm -hmm. And that's only something that you can talk around. I don't know how else to say it, but you all of a sudden feel like the feeling of whatever it is that you want from that experience out there, you're experiencing it now. Mm -hmm. And your heart is actually connecting to that and your brain is actually connecting to that and there's no longer separation. Mm -hmm. So there are degrees to this. Some people, when they get into that slow level of theta brain waves, the lights are out in their neocortex. They're not thinking anymore. And theta, there's no mechanism there. You're, you've, you've no, you're no longer aware of the outer world. Well, but if you're still aware, then there's, there's only one other thing you can start interacting with, is energy and frequency. So by repeatedly feeling it and experiencing and paying attention to it, relaxing into it, enjoying it, um, you know, uh, falling in love with it, staying present with it, uh, surrendering to it, becoming more of that and less of you. It takes training, of course. Sooner or later, something really magical happens, and we start to see people have a very dramatic shift in their in their nervous system. And I'm not talking about a little shift. They start producing a very aroused state of connection, and. 100% of the time when people move into these gamma brainwave states, there's a tremendous feeling of bliss, of ecstasy, of a connection, of pure love, of just gratitude for being alive. Now, typically the arousal that we experience in our bodies usually comes from pain, mm -hmm. from, from anger and aggression, from fear, orgasm. These are these are the only things that really, really produce arousals in the body. But this arousal is happening in every single cell of the body. And it's the autonomic nervous system that's getting very, very, very regulated. So, so the practice over and over again, the study of understanding when you're in the quantum, you're actually not kasha. 
-hmm. You are not Kasha. You've laid down Kasha mm -hmm. as the as the personality. And now you're just consciousness, the act of understanding in that realm that every thought is a frequency and that you're connected and that you're not your body when you're there is a constant practice. And then the surrendering and letting go is a never ending process. Why? Because the surrender that I do today is so much different than the surrender that I was doing a year ago. Why? Because I keep practicing, letting go and trusting in this, at this place called the unknown. So in our workshops that we do around the world, in our retreats, uh, that we do progressive retreats, uh, week-long events, you stick with it by the end of that uh, week-long or a few days, you will have a much greater understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, and when we see people that move into these elegant brain states, when we draw blood from them, there's so much information in that blood that reflects that they've interacted with wholeness or oneness. There's, there's better enzymes, there's better metabolites, there's better derivatives, there's better immunity. Uh, it, it, it affects uh, the, the function of cancer cells, it diminishes their energy, it, it downregulates genes for Alzheimer's, it's resistant to viruses, uh, it changes the gut microbiome. Uh, there's so many wonderful things uh, that demonstrate that, that the information that the person has when they're in that state of connection causes them to feel so good that they don't want the moment to end. They want to have one long experience of that moment. And, and those slower brain waves cause the moment to feel bigger, like we have more time. Beta is like, we got one moment, it's way out here. In beta, it seems like time is like this. In, in theta, you got a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a plenty of time for you to unravel anything. So, so it's a practice and it's not something um, that I want to emphasize is mm -hmm. necessary because mm -hmm. some people who move into coherent alpha states, they have profound experiences too, because mm -hmm. they've just switched gears. And some people who sustain theta for an extended period of time are going through a dramatic metabolic changes in their nervous system, their gastrointestinal system, their reproductive system, their immune system. This is all order and the body's restoring and repairing and regenerating and melatonin levels are changing and there's all kinds of wonderful things going on for growth and repair in the body. The arousal that happens in gamma is energy and forming matter. And when that occurs, many times there's an upgrade mm -hmm. to a person's body, like there's a tumor and now it's gone. There's the Parkinson's disease now it's gone there's the eczema and now it's gone after 50 years so so <clears throat> practice 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 thank you and if i may add like for me it's like it's so yummy and every time when you finish the meditation you know when we're coming back it's like oh my god i just why don't like why can't we just stay there forever because you feel it and also it's something that you once you experience you'll know that it's so different, so profoundly different that you cannot mistake it for anything else. Sure, it's a very familiar, unfamiliar um, feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, so we found that you can have any diet you want. You could be any skin color you want. You could be from any part of the world you want. You could be young, you could be old, you could be sick, you could be healthy, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, it just, you just gotta practice. And I think one of the things that was really essential for my own personal journey was continuously reviewing mm -hmm. the information, really changing my mind about the way I thought reality is. You know, like I just, you know, you think unconsciously that this is all there is. It's mm -hmm. definitely not the truth. Mm -hmm. Let me become curious. Is there anything else besides everything that I know? Is there anything else that I could experience that's unknown? Mm -hmm. is, is, there a, is there a multiverse? Is there infinite... Um, um, uh, worlds that we could experience. Quantum physics says there is. Okay, well, let me just think about that for a while. And if I can get some new fresh circuits in my brain that says that there is, I'll believe that there is more. But some people, they, they don't even believe the quantum field exists. And so, so by not believing in it and then being unaware of it, then you're going to just experience three dimensional reality the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you want something else, you got to become aware of it and bring it to life with your awareness. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so I think we will we will get to actually last question. Um, how do we deal with self-awareness around not being still who we want to be and not living yet the life we want to be? So yes, there is this goal, there is this intention, there's we, but yet we live, you know, with maybe disappointment or that whatever the feeling is, but how do we find ourselves in that? I've been paying attention to um, while well, we've done. 31 or 32 week long events now. And I've been at every one of them. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I have watched a lot of people heal. I have watched a lot of people change. I've watched a lot of people heal their past, heal mm -hmm. their hearts, heal their minds. Mm -hmm. I've seen people create a lot of money for themselves. Many people become super abundant. I have seen people have the most profound mystical experiences that will change them forever. People come to our work for all kinds of reasons, for that relationship, for that job, for that abundance, for that new life, for their mystical experience, for their healing, whatever it is. But essentially though, uh, people are coming for wholeness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've learned. Uh, when you feel so whole and heart and brain coherence seems to be the touchstone mm -hmm. that allows us to no longer want, right? And mm -hmm. so, I see this so many times when people finally hit that point where they're so happy with themselves by overcoming some aspect of themselves they no longer want to be, that when they finally overcome that aspect of themselves that they no longer want to be, all the things they thought they want, they no longer want because they feel like they have them. I mean, how can you want when you feel whole? I, 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 it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So. When we feel whole, I call that the natural state of being. The, the survival systems, the first three energy centers of the body, not that they're bad or anything, it's just that we've done it enough times that something else is born in us and that's born in our hearts, right? So that's a new consciousness, that's wholeness, that's the union of polarity, the union of opposites. And the heart somehow really sends a signal to the brain and tells it it's safe to create the trauma, the danger, the, the past is over. And it resets the baseline and the brain for the person to really see the world from a different perspective. So I can't emphasize this enough because it's coming up so much in so many of the events we do. When it's no longer about your healing, mm -hmm. when it's no longer about your wealth or abundance, when it's no longer about your mystical experience that you want to have, when it's about what do I need to change about myself to have that mystical experience, to become abundant, mm -hmm. to heal. Like I listen to people on the stage that heal all the time. There comes a moment where it's no longer about them thinking about why aren't I healed? They make the connection. I have to change something about me in order to heal. When, that's, when that becomes that, it's the overcoming process that becomes so valuable. So. The person who feels unworthy every day is not going to create abundance. The person who lives in lack every day is not going to create wealth. You can't take that with you as a personality. The person who works on worthiness in their meditation and then spends the rest of the day with their eyes open the other 15 hours, feeling discouraged and unhappy and unworthy, they haven't overcome themselves enough to change now they're at a certain point where they can do it in their meditations with their eyes closed but the real game is getting so good at it with your eyes closed you got to do it with your eyes open and so many people have taught audiences that have healed from very serious health conditions that they felt better after their meditations but their but their condition wasn't changing their values their blood values their scans weren't changing because the other 15 hours of their day they were living in fear and living in judgment and reacting and frustrated and patient that that's that's going back and defaulting to the old self so the overcoming process is the becoming process and it's so important for people to understand and i can say this with such confidence now because i've looked at the data people come to our week-long events and they don't think they're changing in the beginning but our evidence suggests that if you go all in for seven days your brain and body are going to look like it's in a completely different life, completely different environment, and not a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
I'm talking about the majority of people that do it. So the change process is a gradual process. And so then why not say, I can't, it's too hard. I'm never going to change. Um, uh, this isn't working. What's wrong with me? People ask me those questions and I say, those are the thoughts that are standing in the way between you and your abundance, you and your health, you and your freedom. So let's write them down and become so conscious of them that we don't go unconscious of them in the waking day. That's a victory. I mean, how many times do we have to forget until we stop forgetting and start remembering? That's called change. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I really want to be a happy person, um, I can't start making excuses, blaming other people, uh, complaining, judging. That's not going to make you happy. Even though it's an unconscious habit that you've been doing for 20 years, it's time to retire that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, how do I retire it? You got to become so conscious that you do it that you stop doing it. Now, that's going to be uncomfortable because you're used to doing it. It's the known. Okay, and so change is uncomfortable. Okay, now I know that. Okay, so what is this feeling? that I live by every day. And what is this feeling that I feel that I live by? Oh my God, it's guilt. Oh my God, it's unworthiness. Oh my God, it's deflation. Oh my God, it's depression. Okay. <laughs> Nobody's going to change that for you, but you. Okay. So now let's get familiar with that feeling and let's get familiar with how it feels in my body when I feel that way, all the sensations. So when I start feeling those sensations, I don't default to that. So is there value in doing that? Yes, because most people in their meditation, when they hear that chatter in their head that says, you can't do this, or they wanna get up and check their cell phone, and they do, or they feel too tired and too fatigued, and that emotion's not going away, and they're not curious, curious enough to see what's on the other side of that emotion. They don't sit with themselves long enough. They get up as their same self. Don't, don't, don't expect your life to change because you haven't overcome some aspect of yourself. But if you're willing to lower the volume to that emotion every time in your meditation that you feel that agitation or that frustration or that discouragement and settle the body back down and tell it it's no longer mine, we're starting to become victorious. When you wanna quit and you wanna get up and you wanna get busy with your schedule and do a lot of things and I gotta go, you wanna lay down and you are aware that your body's doing that and you go to your body, mm -mm not today, and you execute a will that's greater than the program, that's a victory as well. And now you're taming the animal. You are telling the body, no more. You're not the mind, I'm the mind. I'm gonna say when we're done, and when I get up feeling really good about myself and my life, and I can feel this emotion of my future. And let me just keep practicing feeling this emotion over and over again, to get so good at it, I can bring it up anytime I want. That's what I want for people. Okay, well, if I condition my body to that emotion and I can hold a clear intention of what I want for my future, that clear intention, that elevated emotion, that thought and that feeling, that image and that emotion, that stimulus and response, I'm conditioning my body to feel the feelings of my future before it happens. And if I'm in a new state of being, how am I going to behave today? Let me just get clear on who I'm no longer going to be. Let me get clear on who I am going to be. And let's just see if I could take my body out for a test drive today and actually accomplish this and see if I can maintain the state. Now, here's the beauty. The person who says, how do I get beyond my discouragement and when it isn't working? Because you have, you're not the new personality. You're still the old personality asking, when is it going to change? When's this event going to change to make me feel better? A person who's creating from the field instead of from matter, who's experimenting fully, if they're fully feeling the emotion of their future, they wouldn't be looking for it. Why would you be looking for it if you feel like it already happened? Now that's when the magic starts to happen in our lives. And when it gets to be, you're so uncompromising that no person, no problem, no circumstance, no world event, no in-law, no bank account, no thing on the news is going to cause you to default back to that old self. You no longer belong to that past or present personal reality that you've been living. You belong to a new one. And so it's not the problem that you default and go unconscious. The problem is how long are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. 
So then when the outcomes start happening in your life and you say, I'm not doing anything, it just seems like it's happening around me. Now you start believing now that you're more the creator of your life instead of the victim of your life. And I want every person to have that experience because when they do, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to not want to change anything in their past because it brought them to that moment. Mm -hmm. The second thing they're going to do is they're going to feel so great that they actually did it, that they're going to become more kind, more caring, more loving, more giving, more present, more whole. And when we do that, we tend to take care of one another. We tend to love one another. We tend to support one another. We tend to inform one another. We tend to heal ourselves and heal others. So we, we tend to demonstrate what it looks like and shine really for others so that they can shine. So, so if there's no overcoming of the old self in the meditation, just because you've made your meditation another thing you have to do and you forgot what you're doing and why you're doing and doing it and you get up as the same person or you're defaulting and reacting to the same people at the same emotional responses and thinking the same way about the same things in your life, um, your, your life's going to stay the same. So to get up then and to maintain that state your entire day and not try to predict when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, because if you do, you're back to that Newtonian model of reality. Newtonian classical physics is about predictable. Make it be about the quantum, the unknown, and just stay in that energy and just be curious. Do the experiment to see what kind of things happen in your life. Then it gets to be less of a have to and more fun. And that's the thing that I love the most about our community. What I love the most about our community is that people do the work, not because they have to. They do the work because they don't want the magic to end. They don't want it to stop. They don't want those synchronicities to stop. They're seeing events take place in their life that are, that are causing them to be mystified. Like, oh my God, I, somehow that, that thing that happened out there is a result of what I'm doing in here. Let me pay attention to what I'm doing here. Let me keep doing it because I want to get more of that. And every synchronicity, every opportunity, every coincidence, a person doesn't go, oh, geez, I had another synchronicity today. They say, oh my God, that feels really exciting. That feels really inspiring. And they use that energy to continue the creative process. Beautiful, thank you. So let's be creative, let's be curious, let's be playful. And let's actually also be appreciative of our efforts, right? Let's not- Yeah, and, and, and for me, uh, 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 to really experiment, mm -hmm. <clears throat> be in the experiment, you, can, I, you can't tell me now and I'm saying this just because, not because of me. I mean, I've had my own great experiences in my journey, but listening to so many other people in this work and looking at the scientific evidence that we have and the testimonials of people on the stage, they're the four minute mile, they're breaking through a certain level of consciousness. You can't tell me it doesn't work. I know I can't, it's not, it's just not like it doesn't work. It's like, I don't work. Or, you know, people say, hey, I did three meditations and I don't have any abundance yet. And I tell them, you're not that good. I don't know what else to say. You're not that good. Keep practicing. Keep, keep getting that brain more coherent. Get a better signal. Keep getting that heart more coherent. Feel a little bit more so that you can draw the experience to you. Uh, practice, practice. Don't get discouraged. That's a program. Don't give up. That's a program. Don't feel like you failed. That's a program. Don't think that there's something wrong with you because everybody else is doing it and you're not. That's a program. People say, what's wrong with me? I said, the only thing that's wrong with you is you haven't gotten beyond the thought that there's something wrong with you. What's on the other side of that? Be curious. Hey, I'm going to sit through this frustration. And instead of getting up and turning on my cell phone and getting distracted from this frustration, I'm going to sit in this frustration. I'm going to work with my body till there's, it's free from it. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a lifetime. A, that, that, that moment is defining you in eternity. And when it's the hardest, I believe it matters the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for inspiring us as we await you in Poland. So let's maybe talk a little bit, you know, about Poland upcoming event, hopefully next year in February. Yes, yes, our plan is to come in February. I think we're pretty locked in at that point. Mm -hmm. um, our progressive workshops have changed dramatically. I mean, I just did one with, that we filmed in Denver for with 3,000 in the United States, from Denver, Colorado, for 3,000 people. And 
uh, I was supposed to stick to the script and do, and I, we just, I'm just not the same guy anymore. So, so they're, 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 they're really a good taste of what a week long event will feel like. And the world is ready. I mean, the world is ready. So coming to Poland is something that I've wanted to do for many years now. And, and, and gosh, I think we got the right time now. And I think we, it's, it's the right place. And, um, God, it's a great invitation to retreat from your life for just a few days and, and learn some profound knowledge about yourself. And if knowledge is power, the knowledge about yourself is self empowerment and then learn what to do with it. Take that theory, that philosophy, that knowledge, that intellectual data and, and apply it and personalize it, demonstrate it, you know, do something with it to have the experience of the truth of that philosophy and embody it and do it enough times that it gets easy and you become that knowledge. And that's what, that's what the, uh, the progressive workshops are about and it's a good primer it's a good uh, preparation for our week-long events because uh, in our week-long events uh, people will experience uh, uh, and and witness the most amazing things that that will cause them to no longer go back to their life as the same person yes so we're waiting the dates are set so i will be sharing with you all the new dates uh, for the progressive workshop as well as we have secure date for a long week event uh, in may so we're working on that too and also with that being said we just as a reminder for those who are curious or may not be aware we have already four polish meditations that are translated they available at dr joe dispenza website i also will be posting the links again so we have generous present moment we have morning and evening meditations we have blessing of the energy center swan as well turning a new potential and we are just releasing literally as we finish um, this recording um, this 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 q a for you guys we will be releasing new meditation which is reconditioning body to the um new mind so stay tuned as well as as we have a gift for you which is a promo code that will give you 20 percent for 48 hours to purchase on all Polish translated um, uh, meditations. And also there's more coming, another a blessing of the energy centers two and three is coming. The whole collection of sync meditations is coming. So we are working in the background to have for you, you know, the, the materials to get ready, to be ready. Yeah, and I think, I really think um, uh, the more you practice, the more enjoyable uh, the event will be. And so, all of those meditations are really the meditations that we'll be doing at the progressive workshop. And, and, um, of course it'll be more evolved by the time February comes around, but it's a good foundation uh, for people to practice again, be the scientist in your life and measure the effects of you at cause and see what it does. So, yes. So stay tuned. All information will be following up after, um, our conversation here with Dr. Joe and Dr. Joe, thank you so much for um, spending time with us and and bringing this beautiful inspiration to our hearts. So uh, we'll see you soon in this space and in Poland. So thank you. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to being there. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so thank much. You. So see you there, okay? Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Hi. And